uh, to our other panelists here to start the recording. Okay, welcome everybody to building a high flex course to support student success. Um, I'm so happy to be here with you today. My name is Dr. Bethany Simonich. I'm QM's Director of Research and Innovation. And I am here joined by Dr. Wendy Teets, our presenter today. Um, she's going to start in just one minute. I wanted to do just two slides to kind of make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of definition and we all have the same foundational knowledge before Wendy dives in to the magic that she does in her HyFlex course. Okay, so types and modalities of courses, just so we're clear from the beginning on definitions. When you have an asynchronous online course, that is a 100% online course, there are no scheduled meeting times for you or your students. So the asynchronous modality provides that anytime, anywhere flexibility that a lot of students love. Synchronous, um, on the other hand, is a 100% online course, but there are scheduled meeting times for you and your students. So for example, if you have planned a 100% online course for the fall, but you still are going to have regular class sessions that you'll meet over Zoom or other web conferencing um, software with your students, that would be a synchronous online course. Hybrid combines, you know, kind of the best of both worlds, a lot of faculty like to say, because it's both face-to-face -face attendance and online attendance. So the percentage might vary, but with a hybrid course, you have set meeting times with your students, and those are the face-to-face -face meeting times. And then you have a portion of the course that is online, which is usually in an asynchronous format. Um, high flex, which is what we're going to talk about today, is a unique type of modality. So I've heard a lot of uh, confusing definitions out there lately that high flex is, is three different courses or high flex is just a variation of hybrid. And it's really not. It's a unique type of course. Um, it is one single course that students sign up for, but throughout the term, students have the option for any given class period to attend that face-to-face to attend synchronously online or to participate in the class asynchronously online. So there's a lot more work involved as you can imagine in the design and the facilitation or the teaching of the course. And then finally, of course, we have our face-to-face -face courses and that is um, scheduled meeting times with your students face-to-face. -face. Even if you have some materials that you are uh, uploading in your learning management system, it's still a face-to-face -face course and students register for that and don't have any expectation that they're going to have any required synchronous, um, for example, um, meetings. Okay, and just to note about QM and HyFlex, um, because I know that many faculty right now are thinking about maybe designing a HyFlex course and if you're wondering, well, how would a review for that be handled? Um, QM can review the online portions of your of your high flex course. So because it is a single course, it's I think easiest to think about it as designing your asynchronous course. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, and everything needs to be up in the LMS for the reviewers. So for example, even if I was doing a synchronous course review for QM, I would still have to have all of those materials in the LMS so that those peer reviewers could look at everything, okay? So for a high flex review, we would be reviewing what is in the LMS and really seeing it and treating it as an asynchronous course and additionally looking for those things similar to a hybrid course so students know clearly what are their options for attendance, okay? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wendy Teets. Um, Dr. Teets is a professor in the Department of Accounting, Accounting in the College of Business Administration at Kent State University. While, while there, she teaches introductory financial accounting, introductory managerial accounting, and advanced managerial accounting. Dr. Teets teaches in face-to-face -face web and high flex formats. Um, she's a member of numerous associations and she has published articles in journals such as Issues in Accounting Education um, and Strategic Finance and Journal of Accounting and Public Policy. She's also the co-author of two accounting textbooks and she has won numerous teaching awards at the college, university, and national level. And most recently, she is the 2020 recipient of the American Accounting Association J. Michael and Mary Ann Cook Prize for recognition of superior teaching in the discipline of accounting. So I am so thrilled and honored um, to present to you Dr. Wendy Teets. Wendy, take it away. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, I was, I've been looking off my screen. I'm looking at the other screen watching 
um, where everyone's from and I've lost track. So we're going to start out with a poll question. Um, so if you go to pollev.com and then you enter W-T-I-E-T-Z, you'll be able to respond. So what we have here, just a couple getting to know you where you're from. So we see spread out over the country, over the U.S. That's great. Um, Hawaii, that's great. Alaska, so we've got a lot of different locations going on there, right? And I see a lot of you in that white space. And just a minute, your time is coming up. Um, just kind of getting to know you because I couldn't keep up in the chat room. Okay, and to join to join the poll, you go to pollev.com slash WTEATS. The URL's at the top. Um, so anyways, let's see. And if you don't get answered, it's okay. We're going to move on. We have a lot to cover today. So I'm going to close this one, and then we're going to do one more location one, because um, I know we have a lot of people outside the U.S. Okay, so do it again. Now, now is for everyone outside. Look at those, look at those population, those pins appear, right? But we're getting them from all over the world, which is pretty awesome, right? Um, so we know this is concern of concern to many of us worldwide. Um, and I did want to correct my bio. I'm not teaching face-to-face -face for the foreseeable future, like many people. I am confined to my home, so I'm still doing high flex, but I'm missing that face-to-face -face piece, which is good. Okay, so we see we have a wide variety of people. I didn't want to leave anyone out that wasn't in the U.S. So now we're going to go on. I have one more before we get started. So tell me how you're feeling about the upcoming fall term. One word. Give me one word. Okay. And we'll see, we'll see where, <laughs> Chicago. Well, that's a great word. Okay. And so this can be good or not. Um, and of course, word cloud, we're seeing the most, um, wow. I just wanna screenshot this. Um, this is exactly kind of what I expected. Anxious, overwhelmed, excited, apprehensive challenged. By the way, my husband is also an accounting professor at a different school. He never taught online before March and um, he is he is feeling all these things too. I'm on the other side. I'm like, woohoo, finally, all this thing, these things that I've always been doing. Now I don't have to explain as much to the students because I get it, right? So anyways, um, so thank you for attending and I acknowledge your feelings and that's pretty cool. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to start with just a little background so you can know where I'm coming from. Um, first of all, so HyFlex is, has been my solution for it. We'll talk about my timeline. I use it as a way to increase engagement in my large enrollment class. So I teach introductory accounting, the very first accounting course that almost all business majors, well, all business majors will take at Kent State and then a significant number of non-business majors. More than 90% of my students are not accounting majors. So what you read in that statement is they're not really invested in the course. So you give me a large enrollment class with people that aren't interested. So that's what I face. Historically, this class has had a high DFW rate. DFW stands for D, F, or withdrawal rate. So, um, and it's, it's across not just my class, but across institutions across. I mean, we see this historically in this intro class. Introductory accounting is hard if you don't do the work on a regular basis and it can be, it can be something students don't want to do particularly on the surface. So that's what I have. And, um, so I designed my class. I'm going to um, go back. I'm going to go kind of through my timeline of what has happened. And the other thing that I've learned through my journey here is anything I can do in a big enrollment class scales down very well to a small class. So I have four to 600 students a semester in this class. And by the way, this class that I'm talking about, this four to 600 class, this is what m led me to meet Bethany, right? So I am ended up saying, well, I want to get Quality Matters for my course, and this is certification for my course, and this is, I don't know, eight, ten years ago, and I went um, to our online teaching program, and they connected me with Bethany. So that's how I went to her, and I said, I want to get my course Quality Matters certified. 
So Bethany's waving at us. So this is actually Bethany and I's link. And she, um, it was great having a non-accounting person to talk about my class to because she could give me some perspective that I might not see. But what I've learned over time, so of those of you that are thinking, I don't have four to 600 students, that's great. Um, in my perfect world, I might not have four to 600, although at this point, it's kind of a challenge for me and I enjoy it. But I also teach classes of anywhere from 15 up to 50 um, in, for different programs. And whatever works well in my large class scales down delightfully. So it's, um, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. So if you design for big, you can scale down pretty easily. But the other, the reverse is not true. Um, I also, so I'm going to go through the timeline of what of how this worked out so i've been teaching um large classes at kent state for 20 years and prior to about 2005 i used a lot of paper-based class activities so i remember the old days where i had folders and would bring these folders with numbered groups to class so that's kind of who i am before i even started this um, around 2006, I added clicker questions, and this is, if anyone did this during that time period, this is when we had the physical clicker devices, and then we had these infrared radio signal things that they had to install in the classroom for me, um, so, and they looked like little Martian ships, but um, those were cool because all of a sudden I could start interacting online. Well, sometime between 2006, 2010, I created an asynchronous version of my course. So it was one of the first courses to go online at Kent State. And I thought this would be really fun to do. And it was new and it was novel. And I created this asynchronous course that was completely separate from my face-to-face -face section. So I had these large lecture sections, and then I had this small section of about 25 or 30. So I did that somewhere in that time frame, 2008, 2009, somewhere in there. Well, in 2010, um, so I had been using, um, I started recording my class because we use Blackboard, we've used lots of iterations, and by now I've gone through Wimba, WebCT, Collaborate, Collaborate, Ultra, so all of those. So um, that was an option in Blackboard, and I thought, why don't I just start recording the class? Because I have this large lecture class, and I thought, there, the number one question I got in those days was, I missed class yesterday. Did I miss anything important? And I know a bunch of you can relate to that, right? So we are, so I thought, well, why don't I start recording this? So in Blackboard, I think it was Wimba, the first um, iteration, there was just a button I could press. And I thought, well, I can record my screen and I can capture my audio, and I had to figure out how to capture audio, and I ended up doing that with my phone. And my phone, I would put, I had a, a Bluetooth earpiece at that point, and I would just dial the little phone number they gave me, and I would connect my audio, and away we went. So it would capture my audio. I could still walk around the class because I put my phone in my pocket, and I started recording the class face-to-face -face for review only. So it was pretty low stakes, right? Uh, for me, it wasn't scary because I wasn't guaranteeing anything. So sometime in that period, so I did that for a couple of years. And what was really cool about um, what was really cool about doing this is I could I found that those recordings were really useful for students for a couple of reasons. Number one, the obvious one that I started with, did I miss anything important? But then also the students that had accommodations who perhaps could not keep up for whatever reason, then were able to go back to the recording. Um, also, students whose language was not English, Eng first language was not English, they could listen again if they needed to. So those were some benefits that came right off the bat from recording it. So then around 2012, I added, I went ahead, it was like taking off the training wheels. I said, well, we've got this option now. I've been recording it, it's been working. Why don't we go ahead and add synchronous, a synchronous option? And if we add the synchronous option, 
why don't we just expand the section? Because now I'm not limited to 250 seats in my classroom. I could add another 100 online. And so we did that. And at the same time, we added polling questions. And I switched to a polling solution that no longer used a physical device but it was a software-based device, software-based solution, so students could access it anywhere. So that was around 2012. And remember, all through this time, I'm requiring students to attend live synchronously. So they have to attend synchronously. Most of our students at that point were on campus, but the other thing I need to tell you is my class was at 7.45 in the morning. So not only do I have a high DFW rate, a non-major class and a number class, but it's 7.45 in the morning. So, um, and also the later sections at 8.50 in the morning. So what I found students really liked is they really liked the option to have breakfast while we were having class. And it, it really turned out nicely. So they had this option that they could attend live online or in person. Um, then around 2018, something happened that kind of shifted my view on this and it was irritating at the time, but I think it was a really good lesson. Uh, well, it was a really good thing that forced me into this new mode. Um, in 2018, we upgraded from Blackboard Collaborate to, to, to Collaborate Ultra. Now Collaborate Ultra, if you know anything about it, it's much easier for students to use. Um, and so I'm like, okay, this is great. But I found on the very first day of class, I ran into two roadblocks. Number one, it was only had 250 seats, which um, did not work well for me. So we could get around that after we another week or two of um, working, we could schedule live events with Blackboard. It wasn't optimal, but we could do it. But the other thing that um, caused me to have to switch to having an asynchronous option was Collaborate Ultra is limited to 25 phone lines. And that was devastating for me. And I didn't realize how many students up to that point relied on the phone for audio because their Wi-Fi was not great in their off-campus apartments or wherever they were. So starting on the fly at the beginning of the fall 2018 semester, I started offering this asynchronous option. So that's how I kind of backed into this high flex model that I just added pieces and finally got all three pieces and then the last two years I've been tinkering with it. Um, so I do want to say that um, sometimes people ask me or sometimes I hear people wanting to do this. Um, I have an asynchronous class that's separate from this. I do not use the recordings from this class for asynchronous. Um, other than if you're enrolled in this class. But I never thought that recording my live classes was a good option for saving for a future class. Because if you're recording a live class, there's so many things that are time stamped in terms of, you know, you start the day and go, oh, look, it's raining out. And then someone watches it a year later and it's cold and snowy or something, you know. So um, I'm not a fan of recording a live class to be able to be used in the future for a face uh, for an asynchronous class. So um, my recording of classes here, this is all one class where students have the option and they know that it's live on Monday and they know they have to watch the recording if they're picking asynchronous by Monday night, you know, that kind of thing. So let me go on. So in terms of how Bethany asked me to talk about how I designed the course and I really had to think about it and how I designed the course, um, is I basically started after I had to scramble to fix 2018 because of the phone line limitation. I started with my asynchronous course because I thought, well, my asynchronous course covers all the course content. So I thought, well, I'm going to start with that picture of what I did. And then what I'm going to do is I am going to look at every single um, class day that I have open to me, every synchronous session that's available to me, and I'm going to map out what I'm going to do in those synchronous class sessions that makes the most sense. So it's not like I'm going to record lecture or that I'm going to record lectures for Mondays and then have lecture on Wednesday. I'm trying to use my synchronous time because it is so precious with things that really fit well in the synchronous um, activity slot. And then um, 
I'm going to do my best to support students in the new model. And how can I best um, use that synchronous time? And the big, the big thing for me, the synchronous time, I want to engage students. That's my chance. That's my face time with the students. And even if they're watching a recording, I feel like that is my time to engage with them. Um, and they know it's they know it was recent, you know, if they're watching it Monday night, they know I was talking Monday morning. And then also it gives me a chance to build instructor presence. So they don't have all these generic lectures, right, that they're actually seeing live me, the me that can make an error now and then. And I think it really does help. Um, the big thing here, and we're going to talk about this in just a minute, is I have learned when you roll this out, you have to allow time in the upfront and the, the first part of the course to acclimate students to this high flex model. Even though we're in a pandemic and everything's changing, you have to figure students are approaching their courses and they have as many different designs of their course as they have courses, right? And so well, the way you design, you may think it's the greatest thing. I mean, I think mine's greatest, but students have so many different models to follow that they have to get used to, that having a slow start to your course really makes sense. And I'm gonna talk about that. But first, I'm gonna turn it over to Bethany to talk about um, some basic design principles. or not. Um, so let's see, is Bethany not on? Okay, so Bethany wanted me to talk about or was going to talk about backward design. And um, okay, so alignment is the concept that all these elements work together to ensure learners um, get to those desired learning outcome. It's part of the instructional design model called backward design. And many of you may already be familiar with it. In essence, you begin with the end in mind or where you want the students to be in terms of the learning by the end of the course. Um, so those desired results are your course learning objectives or outcomes. And it just depends what your institution has. Um, so next you determine what students should do in order to provide you with evidence that they have achieved your learning objectives. And then finally, you craft the learning experience and choose your instructional strategies by finding and creating the instructional material and deciding on your active learning strategies. Having a well-aligned course means students won't be complaining about busy work or wondering why they're reading a text chapter or completing a certain assignment because everything is focused on them achieving your objectives. I see Bethany's back online. So Bethany, do you want to finish annotating this slide, take your, there you I go. I probably missed the best parts though. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to pop in here to say that, um, you know, even Brian Beatty emphasizes that your, your best course of action if you are interested in designing a high flex course is to design a 100% asynchronous online course. And the best approach for doing that or, or one of the most easiest accessible approaches is to use an instructional design model called backward design that Wendy just talked about and is shown here. And just in summary, the content that you have in your course supports students doing well in your assessments, which provide evidence to you as the instructor that they have achieved your learning objectives. Now, of course, we also have to pay attention to interaction and technology. So on the next slide, we kind of pop those in because Online interaction doesn't happen by chance. It's something that you have to purposefully design into the course, interaction, engagement, and presence. So in a high flex course, if you think about it, like you're designing an asynchronous course, you're already going to be thinking in terms of providing interactive applied learning experiences for your students, regardless of modality. So a lot of the types of activities are gonna transfer between those three modalities of face-to-face, -face, synchronous online, and asynchronous quizzes, for example, discussions with some tweaking. Wendy's going to talk here in a minute um, about some other types of assignments that she traditionally uses. But at all points during your design process, you have to think in terms of educational equity, because students should not be disadvantaged if they choose to attend 
in one modality for a class session versus another. So students should all be getting the same information. They should all have the same opportunity to apply what they're learning uh, via learning activities, and they should all have the same assessment opportunities. Additionally, there's a little bit of a bigger burden here in, in trying to think through technology and tools. So everybody that's familiar with Quality Matters knows that you only want to use that technology that supports your learning objectives and your pedagogical goals. Here you also have to think in terms of, of teaching in three different modalities. So you need to think about the technology that you need to do your work and, and support your students, but also the technology that students are going to be interacting with. So the entire time really as you're designing your high flex course, keep that focus on engagement and active learning because you really do need to think about how you're going to support students work and effort in all three of those modalities. Um, again, that idea of learning equity or parity so that, you know, students who attend face to face, they don't have an advantage over those students who decided that class time to attend in an asynchronous format. So Wendy's going to talk a little bit now about the assignments because, as I mentioned, many of those are going to transfer. Um, there is, I think, um, a greater need for a, an elevated teaching presence. So as many of you probably already know that are familiar with the community of inquiry framework and teaching presence being one part of that, teaching presence starts with the design of your course and it follows through in your instruction, in your teaching, right? So teaching presence begins the very first time that you start to create that pedagogical blueprint or that design for your course. In HyFlex, though, that portion of teaching presence that deals with directing instruction is a little bit even elevated, even more than would traditionally be in an online course, because again, you're, you're essentially facilitating those three different modalities and supporting students, no matter which modality they decided to attend in. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the types of assignments I have realizing that everyone's teaching a variety of things. But my point here is I use a variety of types of assignments and assessments. So I have lecture videos like everyone else. Um, so not everyone else, but um, my lecture videos are generally pretty short, three to five minutes each. Um, homework exercises, which is kind of what you think of when you think of accounting, right? Homework exercises. Um, but I also have a bunch of Excel exercises, which link very nicely to real life. And students know they need those skills, so that helps a lot. I have data analytics projects because data analytics is the new sexy in accounting. And um, quizzes, a variety of formats of quizzes. I have exams. I use polling questions. You probably have guessed that. I think polling questions are invaluable in delivering a synchronous class, no matter what we're doing. And then with my smaller classes that are lower than 50, I do have um, different types of discussions and different types of activities. So I use a wide range of things. So it's not just, it, it's consistent and it's the same kind of things each week, but they're not doing, you know, 10 of the same kind of assignments. So I want to start by, I do want to talk about exams, and I don't want to open up a big can of worms here because I, I feel like I have a different opinion than many people. Um, exams in an online environment. So I have moved away from proctored exams and how I, well, the reason I did that is we simply didn't have the resources and that was kind of thinking outside the box here. And I don't want to hijack this whole, we could talk for a couple hours about exams in an online environment, right? Well, I've reduced the weight of my exams. I added extra exams. I added additional assignments. So my exams, I have a bunch of them and um, then they count very little in the overall grade. I added a lot more of the activity because I thought about why do we give exams? And in my mind, I'm giving exams to have students practice. And in fact, I would always tell students, practice, practice, practice. You can't learn accounting without practicing and then they take the exam. So I thought, well, why don't I just assign all that practice? And um, so that's what we've done is we have said, okay, we're going to have small exams, a lot of smaller exams, and students can drop their one lowest exam score. That came out of the pandemic directly because we can no longer rely that students will be 100% reliable internet all the time. Um, and then logistics, when I'm teaching a synchronous course, the students need to take their exams during the scheduled class time. 
And I, on July 9th this year, I emailed my students for fall and told them, here's your six exam days so that they have freedom to design the rest of their life around you know an asynchronous flex model but that the exams need to be taken during the scheduled class time of course if i have a student that's in the hospital or something like that then i work with them but when i have hundreds of students i can't do a whole lot of accommodating so um, in terms of individuals but this dropping the one lowest exam score seems to pretty much help so um, I just found personally, I just found proctored exams to be very stressful for students. And um, it, it seems like, yeah, so we could do, we could talk about that on another day, but Bethany tells me not to go too far down that path. So I want to talk about this rollout of technology over the first three weeks. So um, when I'm talking about technology, a couple things, I'm going to be rolling out my streaming platform first because that's the first thing that students need to know is I email them and I say, here's our link, how you're going to communicate with me. So it feels a little backwards because we think, well, shouldn't we introduce the LMS first? Um, so, but I don't. I introduce the streaming platform first because that's where the first time the students meet me are. Um, and then my second thing that I um, introduce is my publisher platform. And I'm using a Pearson product, but it could be any publisher. And that's where my lecture videos are, that's where the, Excel, the exercises are, that's where the Excel is. And then I'm going to roll out the LMS. Now, what LMS? My institution uses Blackboard, um, and that's what we've been using. Now, this summer, I switched to piloting using Microsoft Teams. So I used Teams this summer with my, the same class. And in this fall, this fall, I'm using Microsoft Teams as my LMS. So that'll be exciting. Um, I've used, but I have used Collaborate Ultra over the years and whatever the precursor was to Collaborate. Or I've used Blackboard over the years. And, um, so, but I always do my streaming platform first, then my publisher platform, and I'll show you an example coming up. And then um, I roll out polling questions. So notice we're taking this a little bit at a time. It takes me about three weeks to get, two or three weeks to get through everything in the course in terms of introducing it. Um, some things to note is you're looking at this and you're thinking, she relies a lot on that publisher platform. Well, um, I am the textbook author that we use, so I've created all the material in the first point in the first place. It's mine, and then I add new materials constantly using the custom question feature that I believe is in most publisher platforms. So I I test all my material ahead of time. So in any given semester, I'm using established material and I'm sprinkling in new material to test it for the future. I'm also using my own videos. I do a lot of videos during the semester, short ones to communicate. And those I also put in the publisher platform. Because, so if you look in your publisher software, there are ways to, um, usually, as best I can tell, um, there's ways to add custom questions and add custom media. And that's what I've done. And um, so when it looks like I'm publisher heavy, it's actually my own work. And I could do this even if I wasn't um, the textbook author because I can add a lot of custom materials. So I have it all built in there. And it's a great way for me to test all the new material. And they actually do that on the CPA exam, by the way, is when you take the CPA exam, you have the, you know, the, the standard material that's been tested heavily, and then they, they work in new questions. So I believe in doing that. So I'm always putting new material in my course. Okay, so I said I roll out over three weeks. What does that look like on a calendar? So this is my calendar actually for fall. And the very first day of class, um, we do, we, we're doing Microsoft Teams meeting and I'm going to get them registered for my lab right in class. And I'm going to talk about the my lab lecture videos and show them how to do it. So if they attend class that first day, they are going to be registered for my lab and pretty much be ready to go with those lecture videos. And then they have the homework due Friday night. So they've got a lot in that first day and we haven't talked a lot about everything because I feel it kind of, they have a syllabus that lists everything so the students that want to go through everything 
can go through it, but they can um, take it one step at a time. And then week two, so you notice we started on a Friday. That's what we're doing this fall. That's what we did last fall. So we start on Thursday, but my class is Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So we start on a Friday. So then the next week um, on Monday, I will be introducing the MyLab exercises and MyLab Excel. So during class, what am I doing? I'm doing the exercise, I'm doing the Excel, I'm doing those live. And that is even better, I think, than doing the, um, a video. I mean, I could have done a video for it, right? But then they get to see me doing it, I can annotate it as I go, and they can ask questions. So that's really important, and that seems to work really well. And they can do it with me. And then they can ask, they can ask if they get, they get off track. So I tried to pick the things that are hardest for students to do in class. And then that Wednesday, I'm going to do the same thing, reinforce that message from Monday, because again, the, our students are taking in so much new material this fall with this pandemic and, and everything is being different for them. So I don't think repetition is bad. And then Friday of that second week, I do introduce polling. And I use two different polling tools. I use one that's provided by my publisher and I use Poll Everywhere. It just depends on what I want to use it for. Um, so we do, we talk about what's due and then we do polling questions and then we might do an Excel live in class depending on timing. So they have, by the time they get to Friday, they, we've already done everything that this do in homework. So I'm trying to ease them into it because I don't want to dump it all on them at one time. Okay, and then that week three. So look, my LMS is getting introduced in week three, which is really two because of that first week being just Friday. But so we have, um, my LMS is probably not that important in the beginning because I'm trying to get them with the class content. The LMS is kind of the framework, but I feel like it's something I can kind of work in at the end. Everything, by the way, um, you're wondering how do I do this? Everything's in Blackboard. My Teams meeting link is in Blackboard, and then I'm going to segue them over into Teams then here on week three. Um, I just cannot throw too much at one time. And then we have a data analytics project that I do that Friday. Um, so I'm always doing things about a week ahead. Um, so I'm doing things in class a week ahead, and they're still doing exercises, and there's a lot of repetition, but not in a boring way, I don't think. So. Anyways, so a couple best practices. When you're doing this kind of class, you always have to think, boy, I'm, I've got my face-to-face -face audience. I also have my um, live online audience. And then I have the ones that are watching it later. So you have to think about all of them. So the one thing that I find, one thing I find really useful is um, class startup slides. Now this is actually a two first slide. I wanna tell you about one other thing I do. So we have a lot of students that are very nervous about attending class live online. And I always do a Q&A session the night before classes start. So typically at 7 p.m. the night before, so this will be 7 p.m. maybe Wednesday before classes start on Thursday, I do a Q&A session entirely optional. Um, when I did it in the spring, I did it Sunday night before classes started at 7 p.m. And I had, in the spring, I have about 450 students, but I had 60 attend, which I thought was a pretty good number. And what's really cool about doing those kind of sessions is you have those 60 students that are interested, that maybe have some anxiety, they can try it out in a in a very safe way that it doesn't count for anything they're not going to miss anything and then those are your people in your chat room that are helping everyone else on the first day of class so doing that q a session is good so what i always do though in a synchronous session because those students that are online with you may not see um, what's going on and depending if you're using video or not I always put up a script saying, saying, we will be testing audio three minutes before the hour and then instructing them to ask in the chat room. So we have, um, I always put that up and then I do a couple minutes before class starts. I ask, can you hear me? And they confirm. And then I put up the slide for how, um, how they get phone for audio because that is so important for students because a lot of students don't have great Wi-Fi and switching to using your phone for audio is a really good solution for many, many students. 
Um, and I remind them every class day of that. Then the other bonus tip for you is my second slide every day is more for me than for them, but I always announce this session is being recorded. And that's a really nice way to let your students know that it's being recorded and to trigger a reminder in your own head if you forget to hit that red button before you get too far. Um, Bethany also wanted me to show you what my Blackboard course looks like in Collaborate Ultra. So just briefly, um, this is my Collaborate Ultra class from the spring. And you can see um, this was before class started. I have this pre-class Q&A session where they can try it out. And so I have my welcome message, the pre-class, and that disappears after the first week. And then over in the left menu, I just have Collaborate Ultra and then information about Collaborate Ultra. And so here's where they just click on Collaborate Ultra to get into it. And then I have another explanation of how, how the class works. Here's their options. They can come live in person, they can do live online, or they can watch the recording and the rules for those. I found I've put it in three different places. It's in the syllabus, it's here, and it's also in emails that I send out frequently in the first few weeks of class. Once they click on Collaborate Ultra, I have it set up that the session is there. So we have a pre-class Q&A that disappears after the beginning of the semester. And then I have, um, I have telling them if they want to attend 745, there's the session, there's the session for 850, here's the session for office hours. And then I always, always start class uh, the first, the first, when we're first streaming the first day talking about this is Collaborate Ultra. Obviously, I'll have different ones for Microsoft Teams, but telling them where the chat feature is, where they type um, here for a new question. And just for good measure, I put in that, that phone, phone option again, because I think we forget how bad audio can be if you're a student in off-campus housing, perhaps, and you've got the lowest speed internet and there's multiple people on it, um, this is a really good option. Okay, and then I explain the attendance option. So I really want students to attend live if they can. That to me is the best option. So I have the slide and then the, the, um, sli the slide title, this is actually a slide that I go through with in my class pre-pandemic, is I say best attendance options. And I tell them they can attend in person in room 200, or they can attend online on Collaborate Ultra. They can pick either time. I don't care which one they come to. So those are the best options. And I find if they attend live, they're engaged with me and all these things. Um, but we have one more attendance option. So again, I hit it again, 7.45 to 8.35. 8.50 to 9.40 a.m. or if those two don't work out, you can view the recording from class and answer the polling questions in a self-paced quiz. So I've, I've been able to integrate the polling questions both live and in an asynchronous format. So students have to do one of those three things any given day and they can switch via, among all three. Um, the other thing that I've learned is we have to be flexible. Again, going back to Wi-Fi might not be the greatest. There, if my students have an emergency or unforeseen circumstances, I have an automatic 24-hour um, extension available on all homework and quizzes, no questions asked. I just bake that in the very beginning of the semester. So whatever's due Monday, they have till Tuesday night to do it. Whatever's done Wednesday, they have till Thursday night. Um, I want to hit two quick ideas for student engagement that worked really well. First one, engagement, pet pictures. So I have my, that's my cat Jubilee, by the way. So the first day um, pandemic hit, we are shut down. I Snapchat my cat, because what else do you do, right? I Snapchat my cat and I'm like, look at this cool filter about my work from home coworker. So I put it on my slides that day. And then I asked students, email me your pet pictures. So you would not believe the barrage of pet pictures I got. It was one of the best things I've done. Here's Fiona. That's actually the class in the background. Here is Izzy. Here's Shredder, Milo, Cody, Bugsy, Oakley, Holly and Crosby, 
and Lulu and Muffin. So these were super easy ways to engage students. They would send me pictures and I, these are slides that I would put up in my class, um, in, my, in my synchronous class the next day or whenever, and they would wait and then you hear them in the chat room talking about their pet. And it was a really easy, fun way to do uh, and how can you not love Lulu and Muffin? Okay, the other thing that I do, and I think we have enough time, we do, engagement, competitions. We're gonna do a competition. We're gonna do a competition and say, let's see how much, how much you picked up as we went. This is only three questions. Log in to pollev.com slash WT, same place you were before. And we're going to do a quick little competition. Just so you can see, I love Poll Everywhere's competition feature. Okay, and this is never done for grading ever, right? This is only simply for fun. Um, and so I have students tell me, I really enjoyed that. I don't do it too often, but they enjoy it even if they don't win. Okay, um, what is the recommended order of the steps to build a quality high flex course? So we went over these at the beginning. So here's your choices. You're gonna have 40 seconds and it's going to close down. So pick your choice. I feel like I should be playing Jeopardy music here. I'm gonna close it down. Um, yep, we're getting a lot of answers there. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Okay, we're almost done here. Okay, so let's see where we are. Okay, that design your asynchronous course, map out synchronous activities and support students in the new model. Okay, so let's see where we are. So we have a bunch of people tied for number one. That's awesome. Okay, so you can see, um, and we're gonna go right next to the next one. Which element should be considered first when using backward design? So here you go. Which elements first? Okay. Answers are coming in. So when I do these, um, I also have, I make them available so students can try them asynchronously. So if they want to test themselves later, they can do it and those watching the recording can do it. Um, Kahoot's a really great tool to do this as well. And again, there is no credit with this. Um, if I have students, I mean, yes. So here we go, we're ending this. So I'm gonna close this. Okay, learning objectives, awesome. That's the first thing we start with when using backward design. So I suspect we're gonna have a bunch of ties there at the top, yes. So in a normal class, the questions would be a little harder. So let's try one more off the beat one. Which of these celebrities earned an online degree? This is our last one for all the marbles. Okay, okay. answers are rolling in. And I saw something, I was just scrolling through chat um, while I'm waiting here. I saw someone say, what about non-pet people? Exactly, I had um, students I suggested that they submit. We also, the things you didn't see, I had someone submit their neighbor's goat that followed them to the mailbox every day. I got a wide variety of submissions and I encouraged them to submit whatever they wanted. And it was really kind of a fun thing to do. Okay, so let's see. 48% of you got Shaquille O'Neal. He got an online MBA from the University of Phoenix and he also got his um, EDD from Barry University, and that was mostly online as well. So let's see where we are. Wow, we have a bunch of people tied for top. So there you go, kudos to you. Again, in class, we're gonna have probably have a little more um, difference making between those. And again, I make everything available, everything that I do in this kind of format, I also make it available asynchronously so students can use it to review. Um, certainly not meaning to explore, exp um, to exclude anyone. Okay, so just some best practices tips. Roll out, this is just recapping, roll out technology over a period of weeks, reinforce it, do polling, um, 
practice your class until you're comfortable with your family and friends, my core family. Um, test classroom equipment if you are in face-to-face. -face. Test it every semester. Use that um, session recording slide, 24-hour grace period. And now I'm going to turn it over to Bethany to, to have questions. Yes, we have a lot of good questions for you. So I have been trying to keep up in the Q&A in the chat. Um, thank you everybody for your patience. I don't think I've stopped typing since Wendy started talking. Um, so Wendy, there's a lot of questions on streaming platform. What is a streaming platform? Um, how do you use it? Which one do you use? All this other kind of great stuff. Okay, so um, what I've used the most over, over the last 10 years has been Blackboard, Collaborate, Ultra. Before that, it was Collaborate. Before that, it was Wimba or WebCT. Um, so I we're a Blackboard shop at Kent State currently. So that's what I was using. I also use, um, depending on what class it is and what we're doing, I, I use Zoom. I have a professional Zoom account. And I'm, I love Zoom because there's so much interaction. And I also use Microsoft Teams meetings. A streaming platform is how you broadcast your voice your slides, your screen, maybe your face, that's a streaming platform. And then typically you have a chat room where students can ask questions. You may have students sharing video and audio. The minute you start having students join, uh, share audio and video, it starts chewing up bandwidth. For, um, and that becomes, a, and remember, I'm speaking from the perspective of four to 600 students. Um, in my smaller classes, like I have a class this summer with 19 students, um, they can share their video if they want, but I don't require it. Okay, Bethany? Yep. And how do you use polling for the asynchronous students who are, who are choosing to attend asynchronously that day? So lots of questions about what do those asynchronous attending students do in regards to the polls? Um, so what those asynchronous students do, I have to first of all pick a, plat a polling platform that has an asynchronous option. So um, I, use, I use Learning Catalytics, which is part, part of Pearson, but I also have poll everywhere. I have a paid account there um, so that I can set up a poll after class with the same questions on it. So the students, so students that attend the synchronous class get graded for participation, right? Because they're there, they try, we move on, they've answered it, we're good, you get credit. Um, if you're an asynchronous student, I I grade it based on accuracy because you're watching the recording and you're seeing all the questions and answers. So I just grade the polling a little bit differently. Um, so it depends on the polling software if they have an asynchronous. You could also design a quiz in, um, in your LMS or in Google Forms that would include the same questions that were in the recording. So you could get around it that way for an asynchronous option. Okay, um, questions about students that might have limited technology. So can students do all the technology components they need to in class from their phones? Or if students are dialing in using their audio for phone, but they don't have internet access, how do they then uh, see your slides? Or at that point, would that student just be uh, choosing to attend asynchronously? Or what would be your recommendation? Yeah, if a student doesn't have um, a I mean, they can do it on a phone. That would be really hard. They would not be able to do the homework and attend class simultaneously. So I would recommend in that case um, that they would have to do it asynchronously. Um, at Kent State, when we shut down, we made sure all students had hot spots or something like that. So we are expecting that you have a computer to attend class because it's going to be really hard if you're trying to use your phone and do the homework just because of the nature of accounting you're probably not gonna do Excel things okay. on your phone. Okay, um, how do you track attendance when students can choose how to attend? I don't do attendance per se. They have to answer the polling questions and that's how, that's how they earn credit. So I don't, I don't take attendance. So as long as they answer polling questions on one of those media, one of those sessions, we're good. Okay, um, what are the accessibility challenges of live interactive synchronous Zoom sessions? Well, um, so I'm using Microsoft Teams meetings now, and one of the reasons I'm doing that is there's a caption, captioning option that students can click on caption, so they can get captions on their end that are automatically generated. They're not perfect, but they have that option. 
Um, also, after class, my recording goes to stream and stream will caption it and then I can correct the captions so I can provide the link within a couple hours after class with the corrected captions. So if um, I feel those are really good options. Um, I've always told, even when we had only the synchronous options, if I have students who cannot do the polling questions during class, they can always send them in to me. If they have an accommodation, they can send them in, their answers, just kind of handwritten um, via email after class. So if anyone has an accommodation, we work around that. And I think the Microsoft platform um, has a lot of options for students that they didn't have otherwise. Okay, and I do, I mean, there's a lot of questions about Teams versus Collaborate versus this versus that. I don't want to actually steer the conversation towards let's talk about technology and tools. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to, but I'm letting folks know who posted that in the, in the Q&A that I'm trying to choose questions that are more about the design and the teaching. Um, Wendy, would it be okay though if somebody has follow-up questions that they could contact you? Or maybe there's a way that we could uh, feel, you know, send you those questions. Um, but some of the last ones here, Okay, Wendy, you're going to love this one. Does the workload of the teacher in high flex classes, is it more than in a face to face class or in online classes? It is absolutely more hands down. And it's, yeah. it's because you're teaching three different modalities. And sometimes that's hard to convey to administrators that, yes. you know, yeah. it, you're having to do and you have to exaggerate your communications over and over to students. So they get it because it's not like they've known all their life. So I think it's a lot, there's a lot of communication involved. Okay. There was a couple questions about guidelines for students who are home and they're joining the, the classroom virtually. Um, are there any things that you tell your students who are attending synchronously, like communication policies, or do they have to have their camera off or on? I know that, that that's been a, a big topic of discussion recently. Well, the size of my class dictates that. Um, Microsoft okay. cannot support 400 cameras at once. And um, I found I will not require video even in my smaller sections. And um, I find most students end up turning it off. And if we think about us as conference attendees, like if I'm attending something, mm -hmm. I'm typically not going to have my video on because I might want to take a drink or stretch. It doesn't mean that I'm not engaged. So I guess I'm really liberal about that. Um, that I'm not feeling like they have to share their video, unless it's germane to what we're doing, but most of the time it's not. Okay, um, questions about your exams. Um, when students are taking the exams, they're all taking them at the same time. Are you, are you watching them take them? Does everybody no. come online or, so I'm trying to combine lots of different questions okay. together. I okay. that I'm getting everybody's question in there. I have the, I have the benefit of teaching a class that has um, numbers in it. So my exams are designed so that every student gets a different exam. So um, they're algorithmic, meaning that if this, if this student gets a question of assets are $10 and liabilities are 20, what's stockholders equity, the next student will have three, five as their, three and five as their numbers. So everyone gets different numbers. I also pull the questions so everyone gets different questions, similar but different. And um, then all those qualitative things, because accounting does have some qualitative type things, I reserve those kind of things for that synchronous class time. So I'll, I'll, I'll put up a short answer question, then we'll go through and, and, and talk about that. So the qualitative type questions I talk about during class, I use my exams so that everyone gets a different exam and they do have to take it during their class time. And I do publish, I've already published my exams July 9th for the fall semester. So those are the okay. dates they know. Um, this is a pretty interesting question and this might be our last one because we're at the top of the hour again. Uh, um, and it just floated off my screen. But somebody asked, um, what proportion of students typically attend in each of the modalities? Have over the years, have you seen a, you know, more students attend face-to-face -face at the beginning maybe, and then you know, asynchronously as time goes on? Or have you noticed any pattern to attendance? Yeah, I'm an accountant, so I track that. So I know exactly how many people attend at what modality. Um, so in the first two weeks in a traditional pre-pandemic semester, in the first week, 
I have huge attendance numbers in class, right? Because they're not sure. But then we go through it in class and all of a sudden they're like, this is really a good idea. And so I end up with a core of maybe 20% that want to come face to face. But then I have this big glob that wants to attend synchronous so they can answer, ask questions and things like that. And they can do it eating breakfast you know, or doing whatever they're doing. And then you have, it shifts. Then there's some people that say, I just want to do asynchronous. I'm going to work every morning or whatever it might be. Right, right. So I would say I get um, probably 20% face to face. And then the other ones are kind of a toss up and it shifts. It's not the same people all the time. I mean, you get some that definitely come, but um, maybe split down the middle on the other ones, maybe a little heavier and asynchronous depending on the time of year. Okay. Uh, last question. I'm going to try to, uh, to uh, get this one in. How do you organize your office hours? I, I assume you just have one set of, you know, office hour times and students. No, well, yes, I have, um, we, we have five office hours a week. And for a long time, I would sit and collaborate ultra and wait for people that would never come see me, right? right. Um, and you would just feel like you'd be on call. So this fall, again, part of my Microsoft Teams usage is there's a bookings app. And I think you can do it even if you're not using Teams. If you have an Office 365 license, there's a bookings app from Microsoft. And I put in a wider range of office hours and students can book office hours with me. And what's really cool is they book the office hours with me a, around my schedule, right? And oh. then they get a reminder email or text or whatever they sign up for, I can't remember. And then they get it beforehand reminding them. And then it's on my calendar. And if I already have office hours at the time or I get a meeting request or something, um, it will block that off so they can't schedule then. So it's really cool. I think it's, it's what our advising offices were using. I saw they were using it and I thought, I want that. So book it out from Microsoft. Wonderful. Okay. Well, Wendy, thank you so very much. We're going to go ahead and stop the recording now so that we could um, show the slide for attendance. So give us a minute to stop the recording.